So continuing the quantitative traits two lecture, it's now time to confront the fact that not all of the genetic variance is additive, which is to say, not all of it contributes to the resemblance of parents and offspring. This is a silly made up model, but it's easy to understand and um, quite instructive. So we're going to consider a uh, quantitative trait X controlled in a symmetrically overdominant manner by two alleles at one locus. And we're going to assume there is no environmental variance. So all of the variance in this trait must be caused by genetic effects. Um, here's the table that shows the genotypes, the three of them, and their phenotypes, 0, 1, and 0. So the heterozygotes have a phenotypic value of 1. Both homozygotes have a phenotypic value of 0. We assume Hardy-Weinberg uh, frequencies, so we know the frequencies of the three genotypes. It follows then that X bar, the mean trait value, is just the frequency of the heterozygotes, who contribute a 1. Everybody else contributes a 0. And here's the expression um, for the variance of X, which, to remind you again, is the total phenotypic variance must be the total genetic variance because there is no uh, environmental variance. Um, here's what it turns out to be after a wee bit of algebra. 2PQ times 1 minus 2PQ. Um, this is going to be a very abbreviated um, presentation of the model. It's more fully developed in two handouts um, that are um, PDFs served from the course website in the readings section. Um, what happens if we select for higher values of x? Um, that will be our question. Uh, the amazing result is we get a response, all right, but the heritability disappears at the point where the genetic variance is greatest, a conundrum that we're about to explain and make clear. So it turns out we can calculate the heritability, which is, as always, um, the additive genetic variance over the phenotypic, total phenotypic variance. And in the handouts, um, I show step-by-step uh, step, um, that that's this thing, which is um, 1 minus 2p quantity squared over 1 minus 2pq. And um, I also developed um, the, the uh, algebra behind this, well, both of these graphs, which show um, the total variance. Remember, there's only one. It's genetic, and, it, and the phenotypic and genetic variance is the same. Um, well, sorry, these are the, the variances broken into their components. Um, the outer curve, this thing that looks sort of like a loaf of bread, is the total genetic or phenotypic variance. And then the two curves underneath, um, which if you look closely, you'll realize do everywhere sum to equal the upper curve. They are the dominance component, which is this simple up and down. And then the additive component, which goes up and down to zero at a p of a half, and then back up at the far end as p becomes close to one. But then, of course, all the variances are zero when there's no genetic variation at all. That is, at a p of zero or one. Um, here's the graph of v sub a, the additive component, over the total vg, right? So it's very high at the ends when essentially all of the variance, which isn't great, um, but all of it nearly is additive. And as the variance itself maxes out in the middle part of the allele frequency spectrum, um, the heritability hits rock bottom at zero when p is exactly a half, because at that point, all of the genetic and phenotypic variance is dominance variance. Um, okay, so it 
at the ends, when p is near 0 or 1, there isn't much variance. But as I said, the heritability is nearly 1. So here's the mid-parent offspring um, distribution, which you're by now used to, to help make that believable. Um, say, um, well, at either, at either side, uh, when p is 0 or 1, the mid-parent phenotypes are going to be mostly 0, and so are the offspring phenotypes. But there is a, a strong uh, regression because we have about equal amounts of um, midparents at a half and offspring at zero and one. And in the limit, this regression line has a slope of one, which is to say the heritability is near one. In the middle, when p is a half, there's a huge amount of variance phenotypically, the maximum. But the heritability is zero. Why is that? That's because the most common midparent value is a half, and that's true for the offspring. Uh, sorry, the offspring phenotypes are then um, equally likely to be zero, um, a half, or one. No, sorry, the offspring phenotypes are one or zero. And it makes no difference um, whether the whether the midparents are zero, a half, or one. Um, you get the same uh, distribution of offspring, and so the parents' uh, phenotypes don't predict offspring phenotypes at all. Um, consider what happens if um, two homozygotes mate. Um, they had phenotypes of zero, and the kids will all be heterozygotes. They'll all have phenotypes of one. So that's where you get um, that's where you get these midparents of of zero, making making kids with one. Anyway, that's you can work your way through all these and see that it follows from our story of how the genotypes turn into phenotypes. And the the key point is the parents' phenotypes in no way predict the offspring's phenotypes. And so even though there's an enormous amount of phenotypic variation in the population, all of it caused by genes, the regression between offspring and parents is this flat line going right through 0.5. Um, there's, there's no the mid-parent phenotypes don't predict the offspring. And as we said, that's because all of the genetic variance, which is all of the variance there is, is dominance variance. It's not additive. So the dominance variance, as its name suggests, does arise from non-additive relationships between the dosage of an allele, the number carried, and the resulting phenotype. Here's another um, set of textbook diagrams from Heron and Freeman trying to give a feel for how this happens. Um, first, a, um, a, a no dominance um, locus with um, phenotypes A1, A1, and a phenotype of 1. A1, A2, 1.5, and A2, A2 have a phenotype of 2. Um, so dosage of A2 alleles, 0, 1, or 2, um, maps directly and linearly, that is to say additively, onto phenotypes of 1, 1.5, and, and 2. Right, so um, the genetic variance is all additive. The dominance variance is zero. Um, the phenotypes are predicted in an additive manner by a gene dosage or allele dosage. Here's a case of complete dominance, the, the usual kind we think about, where, say, A1A1 individuals have a phenotype of one, but both the heterozygotes and the A2 homozygotes have a phenotype of two. So there is a relationship, there is a, a reasonably strong uh, regression slope between the dosage of the A2 allele and the phenotype, but the actual phenotypes don't lie on the line um, because it's not a linear additive relationship. And so in this case, there is um, both some additive variance, that's the part 
captured by the slope of the line, but also the dominance variance, which is the part represented by these um, yellow arrowheads that show how the actual phenotypes depart from the line, from the, from the regression line. So how do we estimate in real life the components of the phenotypic variance? Um, here's a sort of a checklist or recipe. Obviously start by measuring phenotypes, that is the trait values in some large random sample of the population, like these beak depth measurements for Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. Um, calculate the mean invariance. That variance at the phenotype level is VP. Then estimate the heritability either of two different ways. Um, the most obvious and fastest way is to regress offspring on midparent values. And but, part, but the other way you could do it would be to measure the response to selection, for example, by having a drought in the Galapagos and um, seeing um, the response you get to selection. So the heritability would be um, the response over the selection differential estimated that way. Um, the additive variance is then the heritable fraction of the total, so we can estimate it as a quantity, V sub A. It's going to be V sub P times little h squared, since that is the meaning of little h squared. It's the fraction of the total phenotypic variance that is additive genetic, that is the VA part, the part that causes offspring to resemble their parents. The remainder is the environmental variance, V sub B, and the dominance variance, V sub D, and other minor components like V sub I. If we can clone or closely inbreed members of the species or find identical twins, then it is possible, in principle, to directly estimate the environmental variance. And I've thrown East's experiment with corolla height, flower height, in tobacco back up here again to emphasize that for these inbred um, parental lines that don't have any genetic variants, all of the observed phenotypic variants is by definition environmental and also remember the F1s which are heterozygous but genetically identical to each other, their variation can also be interpreted as environmental variants. Here's examples I've shown you before of um, leaf um, shape ratios, leaf length over leaf width, for um, several clones from two different sites in the Wasatch Mountains near here. Um, there are big effects of clone, that is the means of these leaf shape ratios are all over the place um, for this set of six different clones. Um, and also there's a variance um, within each clone holding um, genotypes constant that directly estimates the environmental variance. Um, we can easily do an analysis of variance on these data. Um, here again are the variances within. Here are the mean values of the ratio for the six different clones. The variance of those mean values is an estimate of the genetic variance, that is to say, it's the variance of the trait values toward which the clones tend um, when we average out the environmental effects. And the variance within clones can be estimated as the mean value of the uh, within clone variances, which are not all the same as each other. Um, that gives us then a predicted total variance as these two pieces the variance among clones and the variance within clones added together, just slightly less than 0.01. And the fraction explained by clones is the, um, the variance among the clones, that is the variance of the clonal means, the 0 .056, 0056 number, um, divided by the total of the 0 .00. Nine number. It's an estimate of the broad sense heritability. Um, it's approaching 0.6. The dominance variance can then be separated, uh, given a suitable breeding design, from the additive variance by exploiting the ways um, that the dominance and additive components appear 
in the covariances between different kinds of relatives. So for example, the covariance between parent and offspring is expected to be on the genetic model that R.A. Fisher first worked out as a young man, is expected to be a half of the additive variance, roughly. The covariance between half sibs is expected to be roughly a quarter of the additive variance. And the covariance of full sibs is a half of uh, the additive variance, like with the parent and offspring. But then there's this extra component, which is a fourth of the dominance variance. And the um, quantitative trace lecture notes that I um, pointed you toward in the previous um, segment, uh, and also um, Gillespie's chapter, um, give more deeper explanation into why that happens. Um, so um, this formula also works in the pure overdominance model we developed above. Here it is again, just to remind you of the behavior of this silly one locus uh, model. Here was the uh, spotogram for mid-parent and offspring values at an allele frequency of a half when there's a lot of variance, but all of it is dominance. Um, the um, variance is a quarter, the covariance is zero, and so there's no regression, right? The covariance over the variance is zero. Um, but if we um, take apart the different matings, their frequencies and the offspring parent uh, values they produce, we discover that there is a correlation between siblings um, that's caused by the fact um, that they have this extra uh, resemblance that uh, arises from the dominant inner effects of the genes. So if one of the siblings is um, as a zero phenotype, the chance that the other sibling also is a zero is higher. Um, and similarly, if the first sibling is a heterozygote, the chance that the and, and has a, a phenotype of one, um, there's an increased chance that that's true for the other sibling as well. And this um, extra uh, probability shown as the purple halos around these uh, spots come from these particular genotypes, the, um, the ones where both parents are the same genotype contribute to this one, and those where the parents are of opposite genotypes contribute to this one. And that's why there is a, a quite a substantial correlation between the siblings. Um, there's a covariance of 0.06, um, which is a fourth of the total genetic variance. And that's what the regression also ends up being. Okay, and so that's um, this logic um, which we saw and which is again also in the lecture notes allowed breeders back in the day um, to be able to estimate the dominance contribution just by making full sib and half sib families of their fruit flies or cows or um, corn um, lines or whatever. Um, a very interesting finding um, is that traits closely related to fitness um, tend not to have much additive variance, um, but they tend to have more dominance and interaction variance than typical morphological traits. And I invite you to think um, what natural process um, might lead um, to that pattern, which is um, illustrated here in these um, classic data on bristle numbers in uh, Drosophila. So, the summary, um, the narrow sense heritability of a trait is the fraction of the total phenotypic variance of the trait that is caused by the additive effects of genes. Um, there can be a lot of non-additive genetic variance, but it doesn't contribute to the resemblance between parents and offspring, and therefore it doesn't contribute to the response to selection. But the dominance variance does increase the resemblance of full siblings. There can also be um, a great deal of environmental variance, um, but it's again not variance of the environment, it's variance of the trait values that is caused by effects of the environment in which the individuals developed. Um, and those um, three components 
then of the finitive invariance um, literally and exactly add up to the total. VP is VA, the additive genetic component, plus the non-additive genetic components, plus the environmental, the caused variation, VE. And Fisher invented the analysis of variance, and now and still the basis of all statistical practice in all fields, um, in order to allow these components um, to be estimated separately and in the process um, to provide support um, for the idea that he firmly believed um, in, in opposition to really most of the deep thinkers in biology at his time, um, in the teens, the 19 teens, um, that um, Mendel's genetics were completely consistent with Darwin's um, natural theory of evolution by natural selection. Okay, so we'll come back later with um, part three of the um, quantitative traits story. See you then.